who chaired our last one? Does anybody know? I don't recall. Um, I believe it was you, Will. <laughs> All right, then not it. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, uh, big disc, Trustee Asmussen, do you want to chair this? Or would you like me to? I am still biking home and listening to you guys, so I think it's up to you. <laughs> okay, yes, let's good not idea. create, you know, let's not create a road hazard. Okay. All right, welcome everybody and good evening. Um, call to order and roll call. I see that uh, council members Chapman, Arnold are here and trustees Asmundson and Denunzio are here. And staff is represented by Stackowitz, uh, Webb, Abinat, uh, Best and Watkins. Have I missed anybody? I don't think so. David will be joining in a minute. He's okay. trying to join. Okay, great. Um, and uh, we now have time for public comment. Is there anybody in the participant group that would like to raise their hand uh, or make a public comment at this time? I do not see any raised hands. Okay. Seeing there's raised hands, if something comes up later, we can always come back to it. We'll move on to item three, which is approval of the September 15. 2021 minutes. I was not here, so I will need to abstain on this. Um, but if we've had the opportunity to review the minutes, would entertain a motion to approve said minutes. Uh, I will move, Arnold. No move by Council Member Arnold. Do I have a second? I'll second. Josh. Second by Council Member Chapman. We'll do a roll call vote. Will? Aye. Josh? Aye. Big disc? Aye. I abstain, so that's three in favor, none opposed, one abstaining, the minutes are approved. Okay, so now it's time to move on to city district uh, communications. And since uh, we are chairing this, I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to Interim Superintendent Best for any communications from the district, please. Yeah, um, uh, just some exciting news happening in the district this last uh, week, the board adopted a native land acknowledgement statement and an ethnic studies recommendation. It's comprehensive, includes a graduation requirement for the class of 2029. Um, I think really both important steps to recognize the lived histories and um, different perspectives that our students, our staff, our community hold um, and value. Uh, especially in a, in a time of divisive politics uh, in our nation. Um, I think that, that this is, these are both things that bring people together and promote a sense of unity. Um, and I'm really excited to see them move forward. Uh, the first of many important steps to take, but uh, important first steps nonetheless. And I think that's the, the top of mind for me. I'll hand it over to Mike. All right, thanks, Matt. Uh, lots of irons in the fire uh, with uh, the city, um, including uh, some things that are later on our agenda, so I won't uh, touch on those just yet. We'll wait for those agenda items, but in other news, uh, the city council uh, has uh, undertaken a couple of significant directions on uh, public safety uh, actions in the last several meetings that they've had. One was to uh, support and provide funding support for participating with Yolo County in the Crisis Now program, uh, which is a uh, county-led uh, initiative uh, to basically divert uh, calls for service uh, for mental health uh, and try to shift those calls as much as possible away from uh, traditional you know, police response to uh, having the response be more um, uh, fronted by mental health professionals and uh, diverting uh, those uh, uh, folks away from emergency rooms into other cent another center, which would be to be located still in the county. Um, and a variety of sort of sort wraparound services and programs that go along with that program. So the city council uh, act took action to uh, be an active participant uh, in that in that program, an active partner in that program, including funding to the tune of, of uh, 
just over a million dollars in ARP funds as our local contribution. Uh, other cities in the county have been uh, undertaking similar actions of support, uh, as has the university. Uh, so really looking forward to working with the county to get that program launched. And to help us do that, the city council uh, also just recently uh, took action uh, based uh, largely on the recommendations of our council subcommittee, which in this case was Will Arnold and Gloria Partita, uh, to form a, a new city department of social services and housing. Uh, and so it will be a small department, but with some mighty responsibilities um, and will consist of initially seven positions, five of which are uh, sort of re recasting other existing positions in our organization and then two net new positions uh, to be supported at least initially by ARP funds uh, for the first couple of years. So, um, and social services and housing will basically be that department and that new department head will have a number of key responsibilities, uh, including being the point um, of, of connection with the Yellow Crisis Now program. Uh, it will be, they'll have a coordinating role uh, for all of our departments involved in code enforcement uh, actions, uh, which are, is at least four of our departments that are involved in code enforcement issues on a day-to-day -day basis. So this department will play a coordinating role uh, amongst those departments. Uh, it will also have responsibilities around uh, affordable housing uh, policy and implementation uh, and coordination with community-based organizations around housing. It also has uh, homeless services, uh, which is previously uh, within our police department. Uh, and the staff that are boots on the ground working with our homeless population to try to get them connected with services and housing. Um, and then we will actually be expanding that role by uh, one position, which is currently two full-time positions. It will expand to three uh, with the integration of a uh, supervising manager. Um, the uh, So those are some of the core responsibilities uh, of of the new department. So some big actions that have been taken recently with our council around that, that topic. Um, and the other items I'll just, I'll reserve for, because for later, because they're on our agenda, so. Okay, thank you, Mike. Okay, we'll move on to item five on the agenda, which is our areas of discussion. And first up, is a COVID-19 update. Uh, turn it back over to, uh, to, oh, actually, nope. Turn it back over to you, Mike, to go first. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so COVID, with COVID, you know, it continues to evolve. Um, and I, I think, you know, we've gone through several evolutions over the last year and a half, uh, going on a year and a half plus now, uh, where things have certainly, uh, uh, lasted a lot longer, I think, than anyone anticipated it, it would, especially with the onset of the Delta variant uh, several months back. Um, when we thought we were coming out of it, you know, we were hit with the Delta variant whammy and, you know, we were right back into it. So, um, but we continue to move forward with, uh, I think, just prudent uh, policy decisions and measures uh, at the city level with our programming, with our services with what we're doing in person versus what we're continuing to do online for the time being, including meetings like this. Uh, we're continuing to use the Zoom format for commission meetings, council meetings, two by two meetings and so forth. Uh, we are um, being fairly cautious when it comes to uh, community events, uh, of course, and uh, instituting uh, safety measures when, whenever we possibly can. Um, and what that translates to is certain activities that were canceled last year are in some cases canceled again this year, such as the Nutcracker. Um, you know, and in particular in that case, it's, you know, it's kids. And at the time that we needed to make a decision, even with vaccines just now rolling out for, for kids, you know, it seemed like the prudent call to make at the time. And I think still is. Uh, but we're also going to be... Uh, you're rolling word out about holiday tree lighting and you know festivities around that will be modified you know again this year um we are back to uh 
having some rental of facilities like the Vets uh, Memorial Center, uh, uh, albeit with, again, uh, you know, being, being very cautious about uh, safety protocols. The other aspect of uh, COVID, of course, we have our, um, our vaccine uh, policy for staff uh, that is in full throes of implementation. It's been going very, very well. Um, I'll say I'm quite proud of you know our staff team and, um, and what they've uh, accomplished around that. Uh, and then with Healthy Davis Together, um, I don't remember if we have a separate agenda item for Healthy Davis Together or if it's sort of folded into this, uh, Kelly. It now would be the time. Yeah, yeah good. okay, that's what I thought. Um, so with Healthy Davis Together, we are also at a, at a point of transition. Uh, the primary uh, you know, funding for Healthy Davis Together and a lot of the programs were anticipated to be wrapping up at the end of this calendar year. And so um, we will be bringing a recommendation to our city council next week on the 16th uh, with a recommendation coming from our subcommittee uh, around um, the continuation of the HDT saliva-based testing platform uh, and a recommendation that that continue through the end of the school year uh, in the community. Uh, and a recommendation to help support that effort with um, some of our ARP funds. Uh, and so we'll see that the agenda packet will come out Friday this week with the holiday tomorrow, uh, but we'll see the a staff report on that coming out uh, in that packet Friday. And that subcommittee with our ARP funds is Council Member Arnold and uh, Barrett. So, uh, so looking forward to the council discussion and direction on that. Um, and uh, I know that the school district is, you know, engaged uh, around that as well. And um, I think the other, the only other aspect with HDT that I wanted to report is the the effluent testing. Uh, ergo, the wastewater stream testing that we've been doing to help identify, you know, areas of, of uptick uh, in uh, COVID rates around town and using that as a communications tool, uh, the information from that as a communications tool to help target areas of the city, but that may need to sort of ramp up a response. And that program will also continue through the end of calendar year 2022. Uh, and so we're looking forward to that program uh, continuing forward as it has been. Uh, and that one does not require additional funding support uh, from the city to, to continue it forward. So that's in a nutshell, uh, so some of our COVID updates. Great, thanks Mike. Before I turn to you, Matt, let's see if there are um, any questions uh, from, uh, from my colleagues. Uh, Will, Josh, or Bigdis, any questions for Mike on COVID-19? Mike, did you want to brag about our award that we won for Healthy Davis together? <laughs> That's not a question. That is a question. Anyone was phrased you want to before. brag about it? Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at the last council meeting, um, uh, Councilman Arnold is, is bringing up something that uh, we're probably too far too modest about sometimes is the recognitions that are often well deserved for our team and team efforts and in collaboration with you know school district with UC Davis with the county in this case uh, healthy Davis together was a recipient of a uh, beacon award from the Institute for local government uh, ILG uh, and it's an annual award uh, process that they go through and typically they present the awards at the league, the uh, annual league conference, League of California Cities conference uh, this year that was slightly modified. Uh, and so they actually attended our, uh, our council meeting last week via Zoom to present us with that, with that, uh, that honor. Uh, and really in recognition of the, the, the extraordinary collaboration uh, that Healthy Davis Together represents. Um, and so really proud of the team, the team effort everyone here uh certainly included in in that in that company yeah congratulations to all of you that's amazing and you know just it has had such a huge impact on our community and i think sometimes we forget just what an amazing effort it was and then we go to a, you know a different town and see that they a different city and they don't have 
that kind of program and you know you realize just how beneficial it's been so you deserve all the credit in the world it's been fantastic yeah absolutely congratulations uh, and i'm happy to hear that recommendation coming up we certainly uh encourage the continuation of the testing it has been wonderful for our community any other questions uh, or comments for mike before i turn over to to matt Okay, seeing none now, um, your uh, update on COVID-19 from the district, please. Thanks. So we continue to do about 6,000 tests a week. I've been hanging uh, there for the last several weeks. Uh, we've got, uh, we're supposed to, supposed to have uh, several disaster service workers from the county come on board this week uh, to expand testing opportunities at Harper and Holmes. Um, we've essentially got students during the class period at Emerson Da Vinci going in uh, and getting tested. Uh, we're seeing those testing rates rise very rapidly at that site, hoping to do the same thing at uh, Harper and Holmes. And um, uh, our board uh, took action uh, quite a while ago, well, it's probably been about a month ago, to uh, designate funds in our ESSER plan, which is our essentially our American Recovery Act funds, uh, to continue uh, testing. Uh, so we intend to continue testing through the end of the school year as well, and are working out uh, the logistics with Healthy Davis together about how, how to do that um, and um, certainly how to fund it. Um, and I think our big question um, is much the same as yours is what will the testing regimen expectations be from Dr. Sisson, uh, you know, as elementary students get vaccinated and we move into the, we move into the spring, um, but we definitely are seeing the benefit uh, our, our students are doing it. We're catching tests from many um, asymptomatic people and able to react uh, quickly to those and, um, and, and I think bring a sense of calm uh, to parents who, especially those who have unvaccinated students because we're really doing all we can do. Um, and that's a stark contrast to the other districts in our county. So, and we see the, we see the results, right? And when we look at the uh, infection rates, uh, for Davis, for our schools, uh, for the other uh, districts and cities in the county, we see the difference. So I think that's the big the big things for us. We've got vaccine clinics, five and 11 year olds. One happened yesterday, one today, one next week. Um, if you have five to 11 year olds, you can uh, get onto myturn.gov, myturn.ca.gov and uh, get an appointment either at one of our clinics or, um, uh, or through your healthcare provider or local pharmacy. Okay. And back to you, Joe. Thanks, Matt. Um, any questions or comments uh, from Matt, colleagues? Uh, Will, Josh, Bigness? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to our second item under discussion, which is facility and construction project updates. And so right back to you, Matt, for uh, the district's report, please. All right, let me uh, have Dave give a, a brief update of all, all the happenings since our last meeting. Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm on my phone. Sorry, I can't turn my camera on. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you, thanks. Yeah. Okay, uh, so let me talk about our signature projects. Uh, we've had ribbon cuttings uh, on two of our signature projects and those are fully occupied. And that's the Early Learning Center at Korematsu and then the science buildings over at Emerson Junior High and Da Vinci Junior High. Our other signature projects, we have five under construction, four elementary school multipurpose rooms, and then the Da Vinci High Tech Hub. Those projects are going along well. They're on budget and on schedule. Uh, structural steel for the Da Vinci High School project will be delivered on Monday. So that project will uh, go out of the ground and start looking like a building. Uh, of course, we have structural steel on site and erected for all the four elementary school multi-purpose rooms. And hopefully you've all had a chance to at least drive by them and see how they're looking. Uh, if anyone wants a tour of our multi-purpose rooms or Da Vinci, please let me know. Um, moving forward, we're spending a lot of time on the design phase management for the Davis High School projects, which are three CTE projects the STEM building and the aquatic center. And those projects are gonna have a robust uh, public outreach uh, effort here in the next month or so. 
uh, as we head into construction documents. We expect to be out of the Division of State Architect sometime in late winter for the STEM building. And we are in uh, DSA review right now for the CTE uh, projects at Davis High School. Next week at the board, there's three significant design contracts going to our board for consideration. One of those is for Harper Junior High School to address the track field and north fields. You probably all know that we've had a significant ground squirrel issue at those sites. Uh, we are moving forward under an emergency contract authorized by our board last week to address the south field. Uh, the south field, we'll start seeing dirt moved on that project here in the next week or two. The second design contract that we have going to the board next week is for Verde Design to look at some of the options cost for the tennis courts over at Davis High School. Our STEM building is actually is gonna land on three tennis courts. So we're gonna lose three tennis courts. Uh, so we're looking at options for tennis court renovation and expansion at Davis High School. The third design contract that's going to the board next week is for Rainforth Grau for the Cesar Chavez parking lot project. And that dovetails into the Anderson Grant or Anderson Corridor Grant. So we have an architect uh, starting to work on the design of that, assuming the board approves it next week. Uh, there is a DSA element. So I've been working closely with Brian Abinett uh, on the Anderson Grant project. And so we are going to hire our architect and then the city will hire their architect for their design work uh, in the city right of way. Uh, Rainforth Grau, our architect, hopefully will uh, provide a proposal for the city scope of work. So it would be great if we could end up with the same architect doing both projects. Uh, and then also Rainforth Grau is gonna be looking at potential solar panel uh, or location on the parking lot at Cesar Chavez. So with that, I'm happy to address any questions you might have. Dave, can you give a quick update on uh, solar and the uh, urban forest guide also? Sure. So also going to the board next week is an amendment to an existing contract with ARC Alternatives, and they are our solar consultants. And so we're going to be re-engaging on community outreach for solar panels. Uh, I understand the city is also doing some work on uh, solar panel locations at a committee level. So we're anxious to see how that goes. But within the next month or so, we'll also be uh, restarting our community engagement process for solar panel locations. Um, also, we, what we formerly called our tree master plan, we've renamed it to call it the urban forest guide. And we are going to be imminently um, publishing the first two web pages for the urban forest guide. One page is the introduction, and then the second page is the tree inventory. And then currently we're working on our tree protection component of the urban forest guide, and then plans for future tree plantings uh, and tree uh, specific plans for each of our school sites for additional trees. Okay, back to you, Jeff. Great, thank you, Dave, thank you, Matt. Um, so let me turn to my colleagues uh, and see if there are any questions or comments uh, from Will, Josh, or Vigdis on this. No, no, no comments. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Oh, okay. I have a quick question on the Harper Field one. Is that so? There's is there work also being done to like where the the dirt is the baseball field? My son goes to Harper, and I drive by, and you see it all fenced up. Or is it just that southern? part of it or is it addressing all of it? I'm just curious. Yeah, so there are, there are three athletic fields at Harper, uh, the south field, uh, the track field, and then the north field. And the north field is the one that includes the baseball diamond that has the dirt infield. And so we are working on a full regrading of the south field and resodding of the south field. Weather permitting, we hope the field is playable by January 1st, the first of the year. And then the track field and the north field, those will be addressed in the uh, late winter, early spring. Well, thank you. Okay. Any other questions for the district on facilities and construction? 
Okay. Seeing none, I'll turn it over to Mike for an update from the city on facilities and construction. Yeah, thanks very much. A uh, number of projects underway, uh, some of which are in the phase of wrapping up right now. So in particular, our pavement projects for this year are um, winding down right now with final details. Uh, some of the more major streets that uh, we've seen um, uh, under construction lately are Covell Boulevard from F, F Street to up to Highway 113. Uh, and then uh, Fifth Street uh, from uh, L to Poline. Uh, are some of our major arterials that have had uh, pavement work happening. That work is wrapping up this week and into next with uh, striping, uh, getting the utility uh, covers leveled off. Leveled off. Um, and then uh, Fifth Street, uh, the plan for that is uh, for the striping. When the striping goes in, it's gonna be striped with on-street bicycle lanes, um, buffered bicycle lanes and one vehicular lane each direction instead of two. Uh, and so that's been something that the city has had on the books to, um, uh, to basically try out uh, via striping. Uh, and then we will in 2022 uh, assess, you know, how that uh, is going uh, and make any adjustments to the striping uh, plans if needed, if it's warranted or, you know, for that matter, say that it's all going well. Um, so working, working on uh, getting that finalized uh, this week and next and uh, Covell, similar, similar place. There's tree trimming happening, happening along the corridor uh, right now, along with final, you know, getting striping uh, finalized um, and otherwise uh, the pavement work itself is, is basically done. Uh, a number of other smaller streets in town. Uh, one that is uh, one segment that's going to be worked on uh, tomorrow uh, during the holiday. So therefore trying to minimize impact on schools and so forth is the um, Arlington from, I think it's Humboldt to um, Calaveras. Uh, that section of, of roadway is going to be uh, repaved. Uh, and basically they're going to try to get it all hammered out in, in a day. Uh, so as to try to minimize those impacts again. Uh, and in other work, we have uh, a, a number of park improvement projects with our sports courts uh, repaving, uh, wrapping up. Uh, we have six locations where we've had tennis, pickleball, basketball courts in various locations uh, throughout, throughout the city uh, that have been uh, completely re redone, uh, basically torn out, start from scratch, start with new base layers. Um, and we're trying a new, a new material that has an interlocking sort of fabric within it that is intended to help uh, re uh, retain structural integrity over time a bit better and prevent cracking um, and settling and so forth. So um, we had a, sort of a grand opening ribbon cutting, if you will, this last weekend for four of the six sites. And then we have the two more uh, to follow uh, just because they had some slight rain delays with that weather that we had come through. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to those as well uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so very exciting. Uh, the Pickleball Association, the tennis groups, um, bike polo, basketball, you know, all the groups were out at uh, at some of our openings on Saturday, and very thrilled with uh, the new services. So they look they look great. Um, so that's some of the in investments that we have going on right now. Um, we also have a uh, major you know bicycle pedestrian infrastructure, as you've probably seen every time you traverse I eighty uh, or Pole Line Road over crossing of I eighty. You will see the new bike ped connector. Uh, bridge that connects the top of pole line overcrossing down to uh, East Olive Drive. Uh, and that is, as you can probably tell when you go by and it's in its final stages uh, with fencing and more of the detail, final details getting constructed right now. I know Brian on this on this uh, meeting today is, was heavily involved in that and also in securing grant funding uh, for that. And I will say that our sports courts projects uh, were funded largely by development impact, combination of development impact fees, uh, some of our community enhancement fees from projects like Cannery. Um, and uh, uh, really happy to see those, those dollars, which 
have very restricted uses to them uh, be, be put to good to good use. So um, there are other projects, but I, I won't belabor those too much and happy to answer any questions about um, those activities or things that are going on. Great. Thank you, Mike. Um, questions or comments for Mike on the city's update on facilities and construction? No, I'm interested uh, uh, with regard to uh, 14th in front of the high school, the, the test of the new uh, setup. I wonder if there's any initial feedback from anyone either on the district side or the city side. Yep, I think that's our next agenda item, Will. Yep. Well, there you go. Yep, you teed it up well. But let me make sure before we leave this one that there are no other questions or comments. Well, I should I should add one just for those who may frequent the district offices um, in town uh, across the street from the, the offices. You'll see the Civic Center gym uh, roof repair is taking place right now as well as there was some storm damage, water damage to that a, a, a while back. And so right now we're going through the process of uh, getting the structural uh, supports replaced and that involves taking off all the tiles from the roof, stacking those up, doing the repair to the roof structure, um, and then uh, reinstalling the tiles. So we'll be reusing those uh, those clay tiles that you see at City Hall. Well, just one comment, Mike. You, certainly you all have been busy um, through the summer and fall. It's amazing how much work has been done to improve the the roads, the bike paths, sidewalks. And um, <clears throat> I know I, I live a block away from uh, Cesar Chavez and I walked by the courts today. They look fantastic. They're just beautiful. So um, having played there with my kids when they were little and you know they were three and four and I wasn't hundred percent sure I wasn't gonna lose one in the cracks. They are, um, they are spectacular now. They look, they look just amazing. So good on you for that. That's awesome. Okay, so Will has led us into our next agenda, agenda item, which is an update on the 14 Villanova and Oak pilot project, which I know we're all very curious to hear about. Yeah, we have uh, Brian here with us today, Brian Avenat. So Brian, thanks for joining. And Brian's been uh, very well steeped in this, in this topic and can give the latest, greatest updates. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Mike. So, um, the 43 demonstration project is one that we've actually had on our books for quite a while back in, just for a little bit of background and context. Um, we had applied for and received, um, been awarded grant funds from State COG for primarily road rehabilitation and some um, street enhancements for the segment between Fort or F Street and actually extending all the way down to, um, to Sycamore Lane. Because at that time we, you know, we were really trying to prioritize road rehabilitation projects with our grant applications, um, but we knew that we needed to, to include some um, enhancements. And uh, this was a location that we felt sort of met the criteria for needing surface replacement, as well as being an opportunity location to improve safety uh, circulation um, for all users on the corridor. Now it took us a couple of years to just start to, to get into any kind of design work. And we had got progressed to about a 60% design level um, and had done quite a bit of community outreach too um, at that time. And then we kind of stalled with some design components because we weren't sure how they were going to work or how the community would, um, you know, respond to them. And so we thought, and, and this was particularly with the Oak Avenue on uh, 14th Street intersection. So we had explored several different design options um, and we couldn't really settle on one when we felt like we we had a design that we felt like could work um, we wanted to do a demonstration project see how it worked out in the real world we were scheduled to do that demonstration on a uh, week of like March 20th in 2020 and that was right when um, COVID hit so we were in a holding pattern uh, through the last year and a half until we're finally able to launch that this week. And so that's what we've done. Um, the uh, striping crews went out there over the weekend, put down um, temporary tape and delineators. I do want to, you know, caveat um, my, uh, you know, uh, 
explanation here of the project was the fact that we're not testing all the design features that are included in the final project. We really wanted to focus on the Oak Avenue 14th Street intersection to see if it could, um, you know, how that would affect circulation and um, intersection performance. And then also the two-way cycle track to see how the intersection design would interface with that two-way cycle track um, that we have installed between 14th Street and D Street. The final plan actually has a cycle track extending all the way to 14th, but for the purposes that we were trying, uh, for, for our needs, what we're trying to accomplish, um, that was the distance that we that we did the, the pilot for, or that we are doing it for. And we're also having to work within some of the existing configuration and striping. So some of the things like, well, we removed the, the, the parking on the, on the north side of the street. That's not necessarily what the final uh, design would include. Um, so uh, we've had it up for a few days. I've been out there Monday morning, Monday afternoon, this morning. Our consultants have been out there all week. They have cameras up today doing traffic counts. So we're going to be analyzing everything um, before we draw any conclusions. But I do have some visuals that I can share just to kind of help you see how things um, operate in real time. So Kelly, am, am I able to share here? Yes, thank you. Um, let me see if I can find it. So this right here, oh no. I don't think it worked. Of course not. Right when I, right when I want it to work, it doesn't cooperate. Do you see anything on your screen? No. Oh, all right. Let me stop I'll that there. Yeah, we see an image. Yeah, still, I have a still image that I can share with you. And hopefully you can see that one. I really wanted to show you the, the videos because it, it it's really useful to see how the intersection is functioning in real time. Here you can see some of the design features. We won't go into all of them, but the over, overriding objective here was to um, reduce the number of conflict points between cars and other users and um, to shorten the crossing distances for bicycles and pedestrians um, and to provide a you know, better sense of organization to the movements that are occurring within the intersection. And you know, like I said, we haven't drawn any final conclusions yet, but from a strictly performance standpoint, the intersection is kind of doing what we had hoped it would which is allow only one car from each intersection leg to, um, to enter the intersection. Your mic muted, Brian. Sorry, right. I don't know how long I was on mute for. My Ten apologies. Seconds. But the, the purpose is to prevent too many cars from trying to enter the intersection at one time for safety reasons. Um, Previously, you could have in the east westbound direction, you could have three cars entering the intersection at one time in the left turn lane, in the through lane, and a car pulling into the bike lane uh, to make a right hand turn. That causes uh, you know, a lot of confusion and chaos, which we have observed sort of um, with our consultants beforehand. And it was generally accepted by, by the community that that intersection wasn't working in the current configuration. So we were trying this one. Um, it's doing what we thought it would. It's doing some things we didn't know it would do, which is during the morning peak, it is creating, um, or has, at least for the first couple of days, created uh, a pretty long queue of cars from Oak Avenue west to as far as Reed. Some reports are as far as, as Anderson Road. So that's causing delays, which is frustrating people. Um, and there are also some other design aspects that um, folks have expressed some challenges with, like getting out of the, um, the student parking lot is, is too tight because we have a couple of, of delineators there that are, um, that are making that turn too tight. So that's an easily correctable thing uh, for you know, a final design version. So I'm not concerned about those types of things. The two-way cycle track, um, first day we didn't have very many people using it. 
Today, when we were out there, it was clear that people were starting to become more acclimated to the design and, and bicycles were starting to use it, which was encouraging to see seeing parents with their kids. Um, overall, personal observations, non-drivers going through the intersection did appear to have, you know, less stress trying to, you know, navigate their way across, um, which is what we were hoping to do. It seems relaxed. The cars going through the intersection were doing so slowly and in a controlled manner, which is what we were hoping would occur. The biggest problem um, and the biggest complaints that we're getting so far is that the delineators and the way that we've set it up um, is kind of confusing. And there's another design issue that is fairly easily corrected, um, that the delineators are visual, you know, visually um, you know, distracting. And so um, you know, we recognize that and there are things that we could do in a final project that would really you know, tame all that down. Again, we were looking at this from an operational standpoint, not so much from, a, from an aesthetic standpoint. Um, but aesthetics are important for our community, so we'll definitely keep that in mind moving forward. Um, so we have the survey up. I can share you some results, uh, share with you results so far. And let's try to open it. And so it's a fairly simple survey. Um, most of the survey respondents were drivers, understandably, because people who are upset or unhappy about something are, are more likely to respond to a, you know, a survey than people who are um, you know, uh, supportive of something. And that's what's happening is that we're getting folks saying that they feel less safe with the uh, current configuration that we have out there now a small, much smaller number saying that it feels more safe. Some are saying that it's about the same as before. Um, these are the times. Hey, Brian, sorry, more. sorry to interrupt you, but um, it's a bit small to be able to read. Could you just walk us through each each one? Yeah, in, there you go. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, especially if you're looking at the split screen um, in share mode, it's going to be hard to see that. So overwhelming responses from, from people who are driving. A lot of these were from the first day. Um, so um, these are just sort of our initial results. Um, not terribly surprising, but a little uh, more discouraging than I think that, that we had hoped. Um, it's really hard to get a sense of what the, how behavioral patterns uh, would change when you're, when you're doing a short-term pilot like this. We would expect over time that you know, drivers and bicyclists would sort of um, reorganize themselves and adjust their either their routes or their um, or their, you know, the mode of travel to and from, um, you know, along the corridor. So we would expect things to sort of settle down over time and that, um, you know, people would hopefully become more acclimated to it and, and learn to, um, you know, perhaps support it, uh, which we're not getting right now. Um, so those are sort of the conclusions that we have, um, you know, at this point. Um, a, that it's doing what we thought it would, creating some feeling that we would, uh, you know, that nobody likes to be stuck in, in traffic. Um, there might be ways that we can uh, correct that. Um, or if it turns out that this design just isn't acceptable, we can go back to the drawing board and we can test, you know, a different one, or we can go with a more sort of conventional design. But um, the bicyclists did seem to understand how to use the intersection. Um, over time, but of course, behavior is different um, for for different uh, bicyclists, and we deal with you know sort of bicyclist behavior issues um, all over town. So that's not unique here. I'll stop there and and you know, answer any questions at this point. Great, thank you, uh, thank you, Mike, thank you, Brian. Um, so, colleagues, uh, questions for Mike and Brian on the 14th uh, in Villanova North Pilot Project. Yeah, Brian, I have a question. Uh, on those survey results, do we have cross tabs where we can see how just the bicyclists responded to that safety question? Yeah, we could, but the problem is we have about 150 responses right now, and it was a very small sample size for the bicyclists. And even the bicyclists, I don't think had enough time to really acclimate to the design, to have fully formed opinions on it, um, and I think that's you know probably true of of you know most people who have taken the survey at this point. Perhaps we should have waited to the end of the 
of the pilot um, before opening up the survey, um, but uh, we didn't do that. So uh, perhaps some of the opinions as we continue throughout the week will both become more, more moderate and, and perhaps some opinions will change. How long is the pilot lasting? Remind me, please. So this is one week. The reason why it's one week is we're using temporary materials and we're using tape and that doesn't last very long. Some of it's unraveling um, already because when a car turns their wheels on the tape then it pulls up the tape. Um, so there are, you know, there's temporary equipment that's out there. So it'll go through the end of this week. It'll come out on, uh, on Saturday. Got it. Yeah, it'd be interesting um, to, uh, to get a sense of whether there's a difference among respondents based on their mode of travel, uh, as well as, as you described, uh, whether there's a change in overall responses from the beginning to the end, right? As people get used to it. Um, because I mean, I don't know. If a driver says it's less safe, less safe for whom is my question. And so I'm not, I don't know. Um, but, but I mean, that's the point of this is to, is to get the feedback like this. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I was kind of thinking a similar thing that you know, if it's if it's the acclimation issue, which makes sense, is is there any sort of education component, particularly for the DHS students on how to use it, but maybe even for like North Davis families, or is it just meant to be totally intuitive? Ideally, um, you know, the the design is intuitive enough for people to understand how to navigate. Um, the survey responses that we're getting don't comport very well with our actual observations. People are driving through the intersection carefully at slow speed. So it looks organized. It's just causing, you know, longer, longer backups for, a, you know, fairly short period of time. Um, but that period of time is important to those who are trying to get through the corridor, particularly, you know, high school students who are driving and trying to get to class on time. So, you know, that's understandable, but the question is, you know, over time, would would they adjust their schedules? Um, could the, you know, starting times of the elementary school and the high school be staggered a little bit more to spread out that peak a little bit? So I think there are ways that we could get around the delay issue, but by and large, I think that um, it did appear to be less stressful for those who are actually trying to enter the intersection um, at the time that, you know, when it was their turn, right? Um, particularly for bicyclists and pedestrians. One interesting uh, observation that I saw was, you know, two packs of, of bicyclists, high school kids heading um, <clears throat> eastbound, half of them split off to make a two stage left turn to access the, the, the cycle track. And then the other half um, pulled into the travel lane to make a left turn. The pack that went first and made the two stage left actually got through the intersection more quickly um, because they could go right up to their stop line and only had to wait for one car, whereas the other pack had to wait for, uh, for three or four cars. So those are the types of adjustments that I imagine bicyclists will, will make over time. That pack that took the traveling will probably not do that uh, the next time when they know they can get around faster making a two stage left. But even if they wanted to, and when traffic isn't heavy, the fact that they don't have to, to cross a fairly quick moving travel lane to be able to position themselves for a left-hand turn from the travel lane um, appeared that they were, uh, you know, that there was a less stressful um, movement for them than it would have been if they had to cross the travel lane to get into the left turn pocket. So um, it really comes down to trade-offs and what types of trade-offs we're willing, uh, we think are acceptable for the corridor. Great, thanks, Ron. Um, Big, just any other questions or comments? No, I, I think we'll ask some good ones there. Um, I, I think it does take a little bit to figure out, like I, it was a little bit confusing biking west and then turning on Eureka, like you said, those delineators are sort of in a confusing space. So I, I think it would take some getting used to, but you know. Yeah. and, and the pilot doesn't look like it would look as a completed project. Um, there are some limitations with what you can do with a demonstration project in terms of the material that you use and how much coloring you can do. Um, and there are some more, you know, delineators and, and post 
out there than, than um, were probably needed. So that's creating some of the visual clutter that can be uh, toned down quite a bit so that it looks um, you know, more appealing and less visually distracting. Thanks, Brian. I just one comment for me. I, I live a couple blocks. I've been I bike through it. I walk through it. I've driven through it. And you know, it, it obviously that's a high uh, traffic intersection, and the multiple lanes when you're turning when you're a bike with cars is a challenge. So I, I appreciate that we're trying to to grapple with this. And I think, you know, the reality Matt can come in on this is the the peak travels probably going to get worse, not better, because as I'm sure you know, state law. It's requiring a later start for high schools starting with next with the 22 23 school year so it's you know the the odds are our, our peak is well let's put it this way I, it seems unlikely the peak traffic there is going to get better and it may well get get worse so i'm, I'm glad we're we're grappling with it Okay, well, I don't think we have anything else on this item. Um, so let's move to item to discussion item D, which is uh, partnership opportunities for career technical education students. So uh, Matt, uh, do you want to start us on this one? Sure. Uh, so I think uh, part of what we're interested in sort of having a discussion about is as we expand our uh, career technical education programming, uh, it's currently focused on health sciences, automotive, agriculture um, and um, media, uh, media and journalism, uh, performing arts, media and journalism, and um, thinking about how we can have partnership opportunities to really get students placed uh, in internships and job shadows and uh, those sorts of uh, opportunities in the community, sort of part one. Um, and then part two is how we continue to have a close dialogue about the emerging needs of our um, of our city, sort of directionally, where our where uh, industry and commerce are headed in the city, so that we can continue to be a a, a pipeline for potential employees uh, in our uh, in our town. So that's sort of uh, what we're we have some interest in, interest in uh, talking about and maybe um, creating some partnership opportunities there uh, into the future. So I'll hand it over to trustees and uh, we can go from there. Great, um, thanks, Matt. Um, Bigdis, uh, any comments from you on this? I know our colleagues have brought this up, uh, you know, during our discussions. Yeah, I think Matt covered it. That that is kind of what we're interested in. I know Will, you know, uh, benefited from a city school partnership back in the day when he was in school, and uh, you never know where it's going to take you. So I think it's certainly a discussion we'd love to have. Yeah, and the only thing I'll, I'll add is, um, you know, I think we're seeing, uh, and Matt, um, please correct me if I'm not wrong, but it increased um, as we've launched uh, the new CTE program, we've, we've found increased interest and engagement with a broad group of students uh, in CTE, uh, which was, you know, a big part of the goal in expanding and in, in, in enhancing and expanding the program. Um, and, you know, ultimately cutting across uh, all, all of our high schools. So I think anything we can do, you know, there's ample data um, that suggests students that have the opportunity to, you know, have real hands-on experience, um, you know, are, are, are better positioned to move forward into a career path, whatever that might be, than, than those, those that don't. So anything that we can do cooperatively to move forward, I think would be fantastic. And there's um, an existing, as you all know, uh, partnership with the Chamber of Commerce um, and the district, um, and that has, I think, borne some fruit. COVID certainly slowed us down a little bit, um, but I think they would, it would be fantastic to look at opportunities to, you know, more aggressively partner uh, with CTE in the city. Yeah, I think we, we'd be very interested in engaging on this uh, and doing some brainstorming with whomever the appropriate team members are, you know, from your staff and, and your, uh, board board members, uh, Matt, we can you and I can coordinate on that a bit, I think. Um, but because there's uh, certainly connections with our local business community, and Joe, you're certainly well in tune with with those through the chamber and so forth. Um, but uh, you know, there's also City of Davis, you know, and uh, positions and you know career paths within our own ranks, you know, that uh, you know tie in with some of these. Uh, some of these categories potentially certainly like to know a little more depth about 
are there particular categories or, or sort of types of, of career paths here? I mean, technical engineering uh, related, um, uh, you know, uh, it, we, as you might uh, surmise, you know, we have a number of, of sort of very technical operator type positions in our various utility programs and services and um, uh, amongst others. And so it's a combination of very hands-on in the field, you know, uh, positions that we have, uh, but also more of the, you know, engineering uh, side, of, side of house too, uh, that could be of, of keen interest. And, you know, we, We've always been encouraging of our departments to do things like internships, uh, but maybe this is a bit more of a focused effort, um, you know, with the with the district to uh, to work out more of a uh, a little more of a formalized pipeline, so to speak. So that, that's pretty exciting. I'm really happy to see the district taking this on. Well, it's great to hear, you know, from, I think from representing our, our colleagues on the board, I, you know, I think there's definitely an interest in, um, you know, specific work opportunities, you know, whether they're, you know, short-term you know, internships that might only last a week or in a short period of time or something's a little bit longer. But I think too, just the exposure, right? There's so many amazing projects going on across the city, whether, you know, it involves electrical or construction or policing or fire. I mean, there's just so many um, areas that I think our students would be interested in, exposure would be fantastic, the opportunity to learn more in a hands-on way. And one of the things we did at the chamber was look at the job fairs and things that um, uh, Vacaville and Fairfield do. And a lot of the exposure to the, you know, to the manufacturing and large service companies they have there, but quite a bit of it was to their public service, uh, you know, uh, organizations. So, um, I'm I'm definitely supportive of you know us figuring out a, a path forward to to get into the specifics. So, Matt, hopefully that's something you feel comfortable um, you know figuring out the appropriate staff and and grappling with. Yeah, Mike and I can connect on that one. Yeah, I look forward to that, Matt. We can we can chat more. Sometimes even just some something very simple. I mean, it it could to your point, Joe, could range from anything from a very simple just ride along, you know, and uh, did it more pre-COVID, but, you know, starting to get back into it now, I've made a point to do ride-alongs with our various staff groups and teams out in the field, and it's so educational and, you know, eye-opening, and those are the best conversations you have, too, right, with folks about what are the ins and outs and the challenges and opportunities with their positions, and people tend to really open up quite a bit, and when you, you know, have that interest in, in their, in what, what they're doing. And I think that would be true with, you know, high school students doing ride-alongs, you know, to the extent we can with um, any number of our positions too. So that's something to, Matt, again, Matt and I can follow up and talk through some, some options and ideas. Great, thanks, Mike. Will, did you have a follow-up? No, I just think it's a great idea and, and uh, Big Dis is right. Uh, that I benefited from one version of that. Uh, that would be Jerry Koneko taking me to the wastewater treatment plant uh, when I was uh, shadowing him. But um, there's a lot of, I mean, I know that there's a lot of work that we do that would be fascinating for folks that want to be uh, um, involved in um, and helping our environment, helping with uh, uh, you know first responders and those types of folks, or who who you know want to take a, a technical education type path, um, working for a, a municipality in these types of uh, uh, ways is a great career. So uh, the more we can do to spread the word about that, the better. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Okay, so we'll move on to um, our last discussion item, uh, which is census data in uh, redistricting. So I know we're all going through this process. So uh, Matt or Mike, I don't know who wants to go first. I'm happy to go first. Okay. So uh, we, uh, board, the board on October 21st, gave direction to staff to uh, come de develop a proposed uh, proposed map. Uh, that would bring the district's trustee areas into compliance with the CVRA. Uh, it was just slightly above, you know, variance has to be below 10% and we were like 11.1. Um, and uh, so uh, we have since developed a proposal 
Um, we will be bringing that to a community forum on Monday, uh, the 15th, next Monday. Uh, you're welcome to join us. It will be uh, in person and uh, streamed on Zoom. And um, we intend to uh, bring that proposal with the feedback from the public forum uh, to the board on the 18th for a public hearing, some discussion and potential approval of, of a proposed map. So that is where we are at the moment. And I can answer questions if needed. Okay, yeah, why don't we do that before we move on to Mike. Um, any questions, colleagues, for, for Matt on the district process? I am seeing none, so uh, Mike, you are up. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, yes, our, our process under state laws is a, bit, a little bit different, uh, of course, for the city. Uh, in, in our case, of course, we went through the process of con going from general election to districts just about two years ago now. Um, and so with the census uh, data coming out in 2020, uh, we are now embarking on a um, redistricting process to uh, make sure at, at minimum that we balance out the numbers between the districts. Um, and of course, the number of districts is set at five. Um, to do anything different from that would require a, a, a ballot measure. Uh, so in our case, it's a process that it requires uh, basically five, five hearings at the city council. We had the first of those last week. Uh, we have another one coming up. It's on in the first meeting in December. And, um, and then the schedule takes us through basically mid-February uh, as currently laid out uh, to reach um, a final decision by council on a preferred map uh, update. Uh, and that is in order to meet uh, the, the deadlines for the, uh, the county uh, to ensure that we have uh, the district updates in place uh, in advance of the next election. So, uh, and the, so those, the, the final sort of uh, drop dead date for the county is April uh, for us to get things in. So right now we're targeting mid-February just to make sure we give ourselves a little bit of cushion just in case. Uh, and so, yeah, we've embarked on that process. Uh, we are working with uh, redistricting partners as our consultants. They're the same consultant that helped us the first time around uh, two years ago. Uh, and so we've just uh, just started launching uh, the process uh, right now. Um, uh, I'll turn to Kelly to see if there's anything I missed that you might want to add. Oh, I think you covered it. Okay. All right. Uh, in a nutshell, that's it. Happy to answer questions. Great. Thank, thank you for that, Mike. Um, colleagues, any questions for uh, the city for Mike on uh, their redistricting process? Okay. Seeing none, uh, we can move to item number six, which is our long range calendar. Um, and um, so our next meeting is scheduled for January 19th. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. That's what so, I have on my calendar. Yeah. Yes. And so I'm sure our colleagues in the city know, but uh, Trustee Asmundson and I will go through a process, you know, in our annual meeting uh, on December 16th, in which there'll be new assignments for the various two by twos and other committees. Um, so it may end up being the two of us, or it may end up being uh, a different group that will uh, be meeting with you all starting on January 19th. Um, are there specific things? Uh, I know we typically a few weeks out add things to the agenda, but are there anything, are there any items that uh, anyone wants to present now for inclusion on that January 19th agenda? Okay, seeing sure. none, I think the idea of, of adding things to March 16th or May 18th seems like a bridge just a wee bit too far. And Joe, you and I had talked about adding um, agenda items for, for the next meeting around housing, mm -hmm. um, particularly related to housing and uh, relationship to our enrollment, and then uh, potential, and Mike, you and I have talked about this, but exploring uh, shared uh, grounds uh, maintenance potentially, uh, as we are, we all struggle with maintaining all of the many properties we have and thinking about how we could work together to 
Great. Yep. Yeah. yeah, opportunities for, for partnership collaboration where we can maybe see, seek some greater efficiencies by working together. Yeah. yeah, we definitely have, you know, clear interest in that, especially in, you know, the current economic environment. So if there's general consensus, that's a worthy agenda item. I definitely think we should we should add it, Matt. Yeah, I'm a little reluctant since we don't know if it's going to be big this and me, but you know what, we're going to go ahead and leave that for whomever is on the two by two in, in January. I think that's fair. Um, and yeah, I think there's a broader conversation to be had about economic development. And uh, I know the city has been deeply focused on this. I've had the privilege of watching some of your meetings and some of the conversations, but you know, clearly um, you all know we're facing a fairly significant decline in our enrollment. Um, and at least part of it's you know, likely to be connected to uh, you know, availability of affordable housing for families, especially young families. So I think that's a, a worthy topic, but I don't think that's a 10 minute item in a 10 or 15 minute item in a, a two by two. So I, I wonder if that's something we think about as a, you know, a, the equivalent of a study session where we, we devote the better part of a meeting to that. I would love that opportunity. Thanks, yeah, that sounds great to me as well. Okay. So Matt, uh, maybe you and Mike can, and, and not before between now and the end of the year, but be thinking about that as a possible, um, I don't know, may end up being a special city district two by two to focus on that issue because it's certainly on the minds of all of our community members in one way or another. And um, it is, you know, it's it's central to our viability as, as a district. So I think it's it's a worthwhile uh, time, 90 minute plus, you know, spent on it. Okay, so then yeah, we'll move, um, um, before we move to close, um, any announcements or comments from anyone uh, here to for assembled in this moment at this time? I feel like both of our executive staff are looking thin. I'm gonna say that, so good work guys. Yeah. Everybody feels awfully stretched and I think it's hard to uh, just appreciate how you know, we all put our heads down and do stuff, how much it's impacting. I know it's affecting our teachers and our staff. I'm sure it's affecting. Oh, you. I meant it literally. I'm saying they're looking skinny. <laughs> they look good. <laughs> I know they're overstretched and overworked. That goes <laughs> That's why good. I'm crediting you with this deep philosophical no, emotional. It was not <laughs> deep and philosophical. Thing. I'm saying I'm, I'm, uh, they're looking good. They're good looking. <laughs> They always have been, but. <laughs> oh my gosh, Will. Okay. <laughs> Not All just right. boyish good looks anymore, Will. I know. <laughs> I, I can't rely on that anymore either. I never have been able to. All right. I think that may be an apt place to just call a halt to the proceedings. And so <laughs> we, uh, we are formally adjourned to next meeting. It's great to see everyone. <laughs> Um, has a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday and look forward to seeing everybody at the tree lighting in a safe and appropriate way. All right. Take care. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Guys.